So good to us, so good to us, Father. So loving, so faithful. Thank you, Jesus.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't it good, you know, that the blessings just of God aren't running after you. They're overtaking you. The blessings of God are overtaking you. Could we just thank our, thank our guys behind me here, please, for their praise and their worship. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You may take your seats. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Who is here for the first time, and I don't mean here in Dumfries, but an Andrew Womack event, are you here for the first time ever? Well, please keep your hands up because the steward's coming your way to give you a card. You will take that card to the partner stand where you'll find, I think it's Patricia. Yep, that's Patricia in the red. Keep your hands up to receive a card. You'll take that card after the service to the, the partner stand where you will receive a free gift from Andrew and Jamie Womack. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, I was just thinking there, I was sharing with Andrew last week when we were, he just came from the back of a, a very, very successful Grace and Faith once again in Telford. And I was sharing with them down there that uh, a lady came up to me during the conference. Now, you've got to remember when I'm there, I'm standing between two giants. I've got Dwayne Sheriff on my left, and I've got Andrew Womack on my right, and me. So this, this, lady, this lady came up to me, and she said, Pastor John, can I ask you a question? And I went, wow. <laughs> She's not gone to Andrew. She's not gone to, to Pastor Dwayne. She's come to me, the fount of all knowledge, the walking concordance. She's come to me. I said, sure. I said, sure, of course, just please, what's your question? Thinking it's a deep theological question. She's come to me, not to him. She's come to me. I said, what is it? She says, Pastor, how do you get your head so shiny? I just looked at that woman right in the eye and I went, that's the anointing of God right there. Hallelujah. <laughs> so now I understand why she didn't go to Andrew. So, <laughs> nor Dwayne for that matter. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. So have you all got your cards? That was a wee fell in story. Praise the Lord. Amen. We are going to receive an offering and uh, I'm going to bring up Chris Cree, who's the director of Caris Bible College here in Dumfries because Chris has just written a book. His very, very first book. Hallelujah. And uh, so I'm not really here to promote that. Thank you, Paul, but I will promote that. And it's called Rejecting Mammon, How to See Results from Your Giving. So I thought, who better to take up, we thought, who better to take up the offering talk than Chris. So please warmly welcome Chris. And can I just remind you that everything this morning, every, every penny this morning is going to Andrew Womack Ministries. It is not going to Glen Aris Church. It's going straight to Andrew Womack Ministries because we just want to bless. And I know that you do want to sow into this ministry. So Paul's recommendation, who comes from a high financial background, he's read 20 pages of that book and it's fantastic. So why would you not want to get it for yourself? Chris. Talk about no pressure. There's something about money that just makes people go crazy. It's, well, okay. I, I, John said especially Scots. I'm not going to say that, but John Donnelly said especially Scots. No, seriously, there's something about, when we talk about money, it, it, it challenges our hearts. And Jesus knew this. And, and Jesus talked about money an awful lot. And, and I want to share some, some Bible verses here. Uh, I'm going to use my phone because... It's just easy. I like electronic Bibles. I'm a gadget guy, and I love the fact that I can have an entire library 
in my pocket. I love that I can have dozens of translations of the Bible in my pocket, and I can compare them and all my notes. So I don't even have to do anything else. It's in my pocket on the phone. So if we look at Luke, uh, Luke 12, verse 32, okay? Jesus knew that talking about money was going to challenge our hearts. And we see this in Luke 30, uh, 12, 32, where Jesus says, do not fear, little flock. Why would he start out by saying, do not fear? Because he's about to say something that's going to challenge our hearts. And what he says is, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I'm like, hey, that's cool. Yes, we ha- God, it's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do you know when else we hear that God had good pleasure? He expressed good pleasure? He expressed good pleasure when Jesus was baptized. He said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And so that means something pretty significant when God gives you his kingdom. All right? And then Jesus goes on to say in verse 33, sell what you have and give alms. Provide for yourself money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where there no thief approaches nor no moth destroys. Jesus is saying that there's something supernatural that happens when we give to the poor, when we give into the kingdom of God. You know, if you look at, at Proverbs, I won't go there now, but there's a proverb that says that um, when you uh, have pity on the poor, you're actually loaning to God and he'll repay. That takes the pressure off. We don't have to worry about what we give. If we, if we truly believed that what we gave away, God was going to repay, it's no big deal. Yeah, you can have it. You know, the, in, in, in America, the, you, you, we've got Doritos here, but in America, there used to be an ad campaign for Doritos, and, and the, their tagline was, eat all you want, we'll make more. <laughs> and that's the way it is with the kingdom of God. You see, with the kingdom of God, what we give away, God brings back to us. That's a promise right there. And, and let's, let's look at another thing about the kingdom of God, because I want to I take you to, um, let me see here, where's my, I'm going to take you over to Matthew, Matthew 6, 24. <clears throat> Try not to croak too badly. Matthew 6, 24. This is a verse you're probably familiar with, okay? When we talk about money, typically we'll land at Matthew 6, 24 at some point. There Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one And love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And I'm serving the kingdom of God, and I just realized the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and I didn't mention the offering envelope. So I'm going to pause right here. If you're prepared to give today, or if you'd like to give today, and you'd like to either participate in gift aid, or you'd like to use a a credit card, we have offering envelopes, and the stewards have those. So just put your hand in the air, and the stewards will pass out those offering envelopes. And I apologize for not doing that at the beginning. Um, But... God knows, and he's got my back, and we've covered it. So just stick your hand in the air, and they'll pass out those offering envelopes, and you can, you can get that for your offering. So back to, to Matthew 6, 24. Jesus says, you can't serve God and mammon. And some Bible translations say you can't serve God and money. I think that's unfortunate because, really, you can study it out, and Jesus uses a unique word here, and he's talking about a spiritual force. And really, when you come to when it comes to money, there's, there's actually two separate systems that are operating simultaneously. There's the mammon system, and there's the kingdom of God, and they are exactly the opposite. And the mammon system is the system that we all grew up in. It's the system that we know from the world. The mammon system is a system of lack. It's a system of scarcity. It's a system of hoarding. In the mammon system, the, the wealthy oppress the poor. But in the kingdom of God, it's totally different. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of abundance. In the kingdom of God, the wealthy bless the poor. Because in the kingdom of God, we know that when we give to the poor, God's going to give it back to us. He's going to repay. And there's a lot of other promises in the Bible that we can talk about when it talks about giving and God's promises. And, And some of them are amazing. And we can prosper in the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God works on a system of giving and receiving. The mammon system works on a system of buying and selling. You mu- it buy- mammon is contractual. It's transactional. The kingdom of God is relational. And the kingdom of God is about lifting others up and supporting others. And when we give, God gives back to us. I know I've experienced that. Lisa and I, we had to learn how the kingdom of God operates because we could not get over here to do what we need to do without 
financial support. Because how many of you know ministry takes money? We operate in a mammon system, but we're not subject to the mammon system. You know, I have an American passport, but I'm living here in Scotland. I'm a, a citizen of the United States, but I'm subject to the United Kingdom and your laws and the laws here. And really, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God, so I've got a whole other set of rules that I can operate from. And the kingdom of God has ways of doing things. And how many of you know God's ways are higher than our ways? And one of the things that I really valued about Karis Bible College, yes, I'm a director. Yes, I believe it. Don't come talk to me if you want to get talked out of Karis. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm all in, because I've seen what it did in our lives and how it improved our lives, and I've seen how it improves the lives of others. But we learn the kingdom ways, and we operate in those ways. And one of those ways is health and healing. Many of you have come up for prayer for, for horrible physical maladies. You've got, you got issues, and you, God has got answers for your issues. He's also got answers for our financial issues. And giving and receiving is how we operate in the kingdom of God. And I could talk for hours on this, but this isn't my time. This is Andrew's time. So I just want to encourage you that you can give into the kingdom knowing that God will give back to you. So um, if the stewards would, we can receive the offering. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray over that as they're receiving it and just bless it. And then I'm going to hand off to Andrew or uh, hand to, okay. Lord, thank you so much that you provide a better way. Thank you that you provide an escape from that mammon system of lack. Thank you that you provide a way that we can use our money to lift others up, to raise others up, and to be a blessing. You have blessed us so that we can bless others. And speaking of that, we just bless this offering. We just, we just speak abundance over those who give. And we just praise your name that you have all of the resources we need to accomplish your purposes on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your partnership, for your generosity to, towards the ministry of, of Andrew and Jamie. This, as you know, will be our last morning. I know it's been a lightning stop tour, but uh, they've had a, he's had a very busy schedule uh, over this last wee while. In fact, not only this last wee while, his schedule is always busy. So we're just super blessed to, to have Andrew here, not only in Dumfries, but Scotland not only in Scotland, but the UK, not only in the UK, but online viewers as well. We welcome you this morning. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, we're just blessed to have you. So can we please give a big cheer to our online viewers? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We just, I haven't really looked at the figures. I just know there was thousands tuned in last night. So we just praise God that this man's ministry is really nowadays, really is a global ministry going all over the world with the true gospel, with the nearly too good to be true news of Jesus Christ. So please, I'm going to ask you one more time to please stand and acknowledge and honor our founder and president of Andrew Womack Ministries, Brother Andrew. Praise God. Thank you very much. Praise the Lord. Thanks. Praise God. It's a blessing to be with you again. You know, let me just say thanks to uh, John and Susan and to all of Glen Arrows 
uh, for hosting this and for giving us the offerings. We didn't ask for that. It'd been fine for them to keep it, but they just want to sow into the ministry. And man, I can't turn that down or I'd be denying them a blessing. So I believe this is going to come back unto them big time on every way. But there's not very many churches that do that. You know, most people are really dependent upon their Sunday offerings. And so... Uh, thanks, and I just agree and believe that God is going to bless back this church big time. It's awesome. Praise God. Y'all agree? Amen. Let me mention a couple of my books. I've got a, uh, some product over here. I signed both of these books, so you get a little signed copy. But this is about you've already got it, and it's got a picture of a dog on the front chasing his tail. Because if he catches it, he's going to find out he already had it. And you know what? This is what happens when you ask for healing. By his stripes, you've already been healed. When you ask for blessing, you're already blessed with all spiritual blessings. Anything that you need, God has already done. You aren't waiting on God. God is waiting on you to find out what you have and use your authority and speak it into existence. This is really a great teaching. I tell you, this is contrary to what most people Believe. I'm going to ask somebody to give this away. Chris, would you give that to somebody that looks like they don't have it? <laughs> Let them, <laughs> somebody that doesn't know they have it. And this book is entitled, Who Told You That You Were Naked? This is my newest book, and we have people write in and say, I want that book on how to be naked. <laughs> That's really not what this is about. This is a quotation God told Adam. When Adam said, I was afraid and I hid myself, he said, who told you that you were naked? God didn't tell him and the devil didn't tell him. Did you know it's your own conscience that condemns you? This is a study in the conscience and this is a powerful, powerful teaching. It would really, really help you. So Chris, I'll let you give that to, look, give that to somebody that looks like they're naked. <laughs> You know, let me share, this is not what I'm going to minister on today, but let me share this uh, passage with you out of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to ask you to participate in something this morning. It says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. This says that when we gather together, the first thing we should do is pray for those that are in authority. And today in the United States, there's 350 leading ministries in the United States that are asking the believers all over the world to join together and to pray for President Trump today. And I know that we're in Scotland and you may feel like this is far removed. And what I understand, most people hate Trump, think he's a terrible person. Uh, there's a lot of bad press, but President Trump has probably been used by God more than any other president in my lifetime <laughs> to do godly things. And he is being attacked and they're talking about impeachment, which really, if they impeached him, it would be awesome because he wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. The Senate would never vote for it and it would grant him immunity once the Senate had uh, turned it down so he would be immune from then on. But it's just the ungodly that are dragging things out and stopping it. Did you know that since the new Congress has come in in the United States, there hasn't been a single bill passed. They are fixated on destroying Trump. That's all they're after. And so we have over 300 ministries in the United States that are asking for prayer that God would just turn this situation around. And so because of the time difference, it's just now headed towards, what would that be, 7 in the morning? So this will be the first group anywhere in the world <laughs> praying for Trump. And so I'd like to ask you, if you would, just to join with me and let's pray. And I know, again, that many of you may hate Trump. There's terrible things said about him. But honestly, God is using this man in a supernatural way. And the wisdom of God is awesome because uh, this last election cycle, we had probably some of the most godly people that were running for president that we've ever had. 
We had uh, Governor Mike Huckabee, which Jamie and I know, and this man has been a minister, a pastor of a church. We had Ted Cruz, who is an outspoken Christian. We had Ben Carson. We had some of the most godly people running for office that we've ever had. And Trump is one of the most ungodly <laughs> of all of them, and he got elected. And he wasn't the guy that I was going to vote for originally, but in hindsight, it is perfect. Because if one of these religious guys was up here passing all of these laws, they would be yelling, you're religious, you're cramming religion down our throat. But nobody accuses Trump of being religious. <laughs> he is under the radar, and God is using him in a powerful way. Amen. So if you would, for a moment, let's just stand and join our hearts and pray, and we're going to set the tone for people. There will be millions of people all across the world praying today, and I want you to pray and agree with us, and we're going to believe that, praise God, this ungodliness will stop. So, Father, we just thank you for those that are in authority over us, not only in the U.S., but here. We pray for all that are in authority, all kings, and we believe that you are giving them supernatural wisdom, divine wisdom and understanding to know what to do. We pray that they begin to start being influenced by you. We bind the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of the devil that is fighting against all of our leaders. But we pray today for President Trump and we believe that all of the ungodliness, the lies, we just stop this in the name of Jesus. Father, we believe that today there is a crescendo of prayer rising up and that as people agree, I thank you that the ungodly are destroyed, that they are taken in the very net that they have laid, that they will be trapped, that this will be stopped, and that, Father, godliness will exalt a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We believe that you use our government officials to establish godliness. And Father, we thank you. We believe that you give President Trump the ability to just be hardened towards the criticism and all of the hatred and that you help him to stand and do what he's supposed to do. And Father, we agree and we thank you for it. We thank you for a revival in America and all over the world. Father, we just thank you that your power is flowing and we agree with our brothers and sisters today that a miracle is taking place and we will all see it that there will be a change in the atmosphere, that there will be a change in all of this ungodliness. And Father, we thank you and we agree and receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. Praise God. I'm expecting that you're going to see, you'll see a difference reported in the news, that all of a sudden they're just going to decide to, let's get on with life instead of just hating Trump. I believe it's going to happen. Amen. Amen. And I know some of you disagree and stuff, but you just, uh, you, don't, you aren't hearing the truth over here. You really aren't. Not even close. And in the United States, the majority of the news media over there, it is just total ungodliness. It is lies. It's bad stuff happening. I know a lot of people that meet with Trump on a weekly basis, and this man is seeking God. And some good, good things are happening. All right, let me share with you out of 2 Peter chapter 1. And what I'm going to share with you today, I believe, is going to be really important for you. If you haven't understood these things, this could be a change uh, in your life, a turning point in your life that could totally turn everything around. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, says, Simon Peter, an apostle a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our, and of, uh, our Lord Jesus, of Jesus our Lord. This says that grace and peace is multiplied unto you not through prayer. This is what most people do. They pray and say, oh God, give me peace. Oh God, I just want your favor in my life. The Bible says it's multiplied unto you through the knowledge of Him. If you don't have peace in your life, this is a broad statement, but it's going to be true to every person. The Bible says in Isaiah 26, 3, that the Lord will keep him in perfect peace 
whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusts in him. If you don't have peace, it's because your mind isn't stayed upon God. It's because you don't have the right knowledge. It's because, you know, just like I was talking about the news over here, you are not getting factual accounts of what's happening in the United States. In the United States, we aren't getting a factual account of what's happening. And if you listen to these things, it will form opinions on the inside of you that are inaccurate and it will cause you all kinds of problems. Well, this is what the devil does. If you are worried about things, it's because you aren't looking at things the way that God's Word says. Thank you for that thunderous silence. <laughs> I know that most people will say, well, that's, no, that's not true. It's because this person did this to me. Jesus was hanging on the cross and he was able to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do because it says in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, he for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame. Jesus wasn't focused on the rejection, on the criticism about him. He was looking past the cross at you and me and he was thinking, these people's lives depend on what I'm doing. And he, by faith, saw people that would accept him and that our lives would be changed. And he thought that we were worth it. He was willing to endure all of that shame. And if he would have focused on the rejection and what happened to him, he would have been the same as any of us. I prayed with a young man last night who said he was suffering with depression. And I said, there's nothing wrong with you. It's your focus that's wrong. Your emotions follow your thoughts. If you are depressed, it's because you are thinking on depressing things. And somebody says, well, well, I've got a lot of bad things happening. I'm not saying that bad things don't happen, but I'm saying that there's always a positive way to look at anything. If nothing else, you know, if the doctor tells you you're going to die, you could always say, well, praise God, man, I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. It won't be long till I'll be walking on streets of gold. I know most people, well, I don't think that way. That's the reason you get depressed, and that's the reason you get afraid. <laughs> Paul said for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. If you got to a place to where, Father, I thank you that it's your will to heal me, and I'm going to believe for healing. But, you know, if I die, I can't lose for winning. I'm going to win any way I go. If I die, I'm going to spend eternity in a mansion in perfection and all of the sufferings and the pains of this life are going to be over. When you get to thinking like that, you won't be depressed even if the doctor tells you you're going to die. I mean, we sing the song about when we all get to heaven, what a day that will be. And then the doctor tells you you're going and you start crying. <laughs> Something's wrong with this. You know what? If we were thinking properly, it doesn't matter what happens. Somebody said, but I'm poor and I need money. Well, someday you're going to have a mansion in heaven. It only took God six days to create the entire universe. He's been working on your mansion for 2,000 years. What do you think that's going to be like? It's going to be awesome. There, if you look at things properly, there is absolutely no reason for you to be depressed and defeated and discouraged. Grace and peace comes through knowledge, not through praying for it, not through asking God to get rid of all of the people in your life who rub you the wrong way. It's not through asking God to just change all of your circumstances. It's through the knowledge of Him. And then in verse 3, it says, according... The word according means in proportion to or to the degree of. So according to his divine power hath given unto us all things. And in the Greek right here, the word that was used for all right there, it means all. All things. Not most things. This means healing. This means prosperity. This means joy. This means victory in your life. This means satisfaction, peace. Everything that you need, all things that pertain unto life and godliness are given unto us through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. If you're sick in your body, you got a knowledge problem. You aren't thinking and meditating on what the Word says because Proverbs chapter 4, around verse 20 to 22, says that God's Word is health unto all of your flesh and life to them that find it. Uh, in Psalms 107 verse 20, He sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. If you have sickness in your body, you are not focused on what God's Word says. 
Now you may know what God's Word says. You may know that by His stripes you're healed, but that's not dominating you as much as what the doctor says or what your body says. You aren't focused on it. Not many people agree with that, but it's absolutely true. If you have sickness in your body, if you have poverty, it's because you don't know some things. I tell you, I could, give you, I could spend the rest of this morning giving you testimony about myself and how, you know, when you're in the ministry, like Chris was saying, it takes money to do the ministry. And I've been in the ministry now for 51 years. And I struggled for a long period of time in finances. And then God spoke some things to me. And when I understood, it was scriptures that I knew, but I didn't have a revelation of it. I could parrot the scriptures. I could say the things. But when I got a revelation of it, finances just began to flood towards me. And now we, it takes us around $5 million a month just to pay our bills, and I need a lot more than that. But, I mean, that's how much we've increased. And now God is blessing me, and finances are flowing towards me, and because I changed the way I thought. Whether you realize it or not, this is true, that the, what, what the problems that you have are because you don't understand what the Word of God has to say about that. It's not because you aren't living holy enough. It's not because you haven't fasted enough, prayed enough, not because you haven't got enough people to pray with you. It's because you don't know the truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John chapter 8 verse 32. And then in the next verse here, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4, it says, Whereby, talking about this knowledge of God, this knowledge of God has given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So the knowledge of God gave us these promises, the Word of God. The Word of God contains the knowledge of God. If we were focused on what God's Word says, more than what the banker says, more than what the doctor says, more than what your friend says, your parents said, your church says, if we were to go by the Word of God, above anything else, you would get the results that the Word of God produce. So if you are struggling in any area, I can guarantee you somewhere you have a lack of knowledge or understanding what that knowledge is saying about the Word of God. So the answer is, you've got to get into the Word of God. You need to know the Word of God. And this is the reason that we have our Bible school. It's the reason I have all of the teaching materials and the reason that God raises up ministries like mine is to teach people the Word of God. And we can help you get started, but you know, ultimately, you can't live off of what I've got. I can share with you what I've got, but it just should help you to get into the Word, and every one of you need to get to where you know the Word of God better than you know anything else. And brothers and sisters, I appreciate you being here. I'm not trying to run you off. But I can guarantee you that probably the majority of people sitting in this room today do not know the Word of God for yourself. You depend on what somebody else says and you don't spend a majority of your time in this. We spend so much time watching the telly and, and thinking and reading things and doing things that are no benefit to us whatsoever. I'm telling you, you need to be in the Word of God. Let's turn over to Mark chapter 4, and let me show you how powerful the Word of God is. Mark chapter 4, this is where Jesus was teaching by parables, and he was teaching on how important the Word of God is. Mark chapter 4, he gave a parable about the sower sowing the seed. And I'm not going to teach on that parable, but that's one of the most important things that God ever showed me. It's a great truth. It's foundational. It says in Mark 4, 14 that the sower sows the word. So even though he's using like sowing seeds as an example of how the word works, he's really not talking about how, how to grow crops. He's using that as an example of how the word of God works. And this is very important that you understand this. When he used something to illustrate how the word of God works, he didn't use a man-made system. Like for instance, school. You know, we have Bible colleges. I'm not against a Bible college. I'm not against school. But did you know you can cheat in school? You can actually borrow the answers from somebody else and you could pass. You can beat a man-made system. You can stay up all night long 
and have not paid attention in class and yet stay up the night before a test and cram all of this information into your short-term memory and you might be able to pass the test, but here, you know, five years, 10 years, whatever years later, you can't remember any of that stuff. You didn't learn it. You beat the system. But you know what? You can't cram for a harvest. You can't wait until the night before your harvest and go out and just sow your seed and think, well, I didn't pay attention. I didn't do it at the right time, but I'm going to stay up all night long and work on this harvest. It doesn't work that way. God used a natural system because the laws of God cannot be changed. You can't wait until the night before you need a harvest and go out and, and plow the field and plant the crops and water it and fertilize it and wait, wait on it to come up. He used a natural system because there is seed, time, and harvest, and you can't change it. There is an appropriate time to sow. There's an appropriate time to reap, and that's the reason that he chose to compare the Word of God to a natural system. So look down in verse 26. This is a powerful passage. He said, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground. So once again, he's comparing the Word of God to like a physical seed. Verse 27, and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. Boy, there is so much in this. I've got about four or five hours worth of teaching on this and I'm just going to hit some of the highlights. So please get this teaching. I've got a teaching over there entitled, the, uh, uh, what is it? A Sure Foundation. I've got another one entitled, um, what is that? Effortless Change. And those two books will cover these things. I've written entire books on this. But it notice it says that he just sows the seed and then he sleeps and rises night and day. That shows that there's time. You have to give the Word of God time to work. You can't just plant a seed and then the next day go dig it up and see what's happened. If you do that, you'll kill the seed. You have to put it in the ground and by faith just believe that that seed is doing what it's supposed to do. And that's the way it is with the Word of God. Some people hear somebody like me minister and they'll give a testimony and they'll talk about how God did something for them and so they'll think, well, all right, I'll try that. And so you spend one afternoon, one night studying the Word and you pray and wake up in the morning and if you don't see your harvest, if you don't see everything work, well, then you say, well, it didn't work. You just dug up your seed and that seed won't work. You've got to leave it there. You've got to understand that the Word of God is an incorruptible seed. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says it's an incorruptible seed and it will never fail. The Word of God has never, ever failed. Amen. We sang that song about God has never failed me. Well, God's Word has never failed a single person. Amen. There is never a person ever who has planted God's Word in their heart that that Word fails to produce the right results. And somebody might say, well, I know somebody that planted the Word in their heart and it didn't work. No, you know somebody that may have planted the Word, but they didn't sleep and rise night and day and do all of these things. They may have stood on it for a brief period of time until something contrary happened and then they got moved off of the Word. Somehow or another, Satan stole that Word from them. God's Word is an incorruptible seed. It never fails to work. God's Word will set any person free from any sickness, from any disease. It will break any poverty. It will break any depression, any discouragement. There is nothing that the Word of God can't solve. But you have to operate in it and do what the Word says. So this says that you just sleep and rise night and day. That describes time. And it says that the uh, seed brings forth fruit and you don't know how it happens. Let me get that exact wording again. Should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. This is really encouraging to me that you don't have to understand all of this. You just have to believe it. Amen. Did you know people don't understand why seed works? And some people say, oh, yeah, they do. No, they don't. You could take all of the... You could take all of the uh, wisdom of the entire human race. Every person that is a specialist in seeds. 
And you could take all of the money of the entire human race and pull it together and they could produce something that might look like a seed and taste like a seed. It might have the same weight as a seed. It could resemble it in every way. But if you plant a man-made seed in the ground, it will not grow. It won't reproduce. We don't understand exactly how a seed works, but does that keep us from using seeds? You know, we were just out here at, uh, what is it, Thorn Hill at that castle. What was the name of the castle? Drumlandrand. Rig. Drumlandrand. And we were just there, and we were walking around the gardens, and did you know that they had a uh, Douglas fir planted there, which doesn't grow here naturally. It grows in the United States. And a man went to uh, Oregon and got a seed. And in 18, I forget exactly, 1829, uh, he planted that seed at that castle. And this tree is huge now. It's, I don't know, it's bigger around. I couldn't even reach halfway around it. And it all came from a seed. And I guarantee you, nobody understands that, but that doesn't keep you from taking that seed and planting it in the ground and letting the thing grow. We use seeds, but we don't totally understand it. You don't have to understand everything about the Word of God. You just have to put childlike faith in it. God said His Word is like a seed. And if you will plant it and sleep and rise night and day, it will just work. You don't have to understand it. You just have to believe it. And yet Satan is constantly fighting us. And it, like say, for instance, if, if it's healing... You could take a scripture like, by his stripes I'm healed, who heals all of our diseases, and on and on. You could take these scriptures and speak them. And a lot of people, if they don't see immediate results, then immediately you begin to start wondering, well, did it really work? And if you quit believing, just trusting what the Word says, well, then that healing won't manifest itself. You kill the seed. But if you could just believe that, Father, I don't understand it, but I know what your word says, and I'm going to stand on the word of God with my last breath. And if you could just get that simple, the word of God would work. It's that simple, but it's not that easy. The hardest thing you will ever do in your life is get to where God's word influences your thoughts more than what other people say, more than what you think on your own. It's it's effort to discipline yourself and control your thoughts. And so most people don't do it. They just sit in front of the telly and they let it control their thoughts and buy into whatever comes their way. But you need to take control over your thoughts. The Lord will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed upon Him. And look at this next verse. This is really powerful. In verse 28, it says, For the earth bringeth forth fruit, Of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. This says that the earth brings forth fruit of herself. Did you know that that phrase, of herself, the Greek word that was translated of herself right there is automatos, and it's the word that we get automatic or automatically from. The earth automatically brings forth fruit of herself. And notice it says the earth brings forth fruit, not the seed. Now you're going to have to think a little bit to get this. I'm sorry to challenge you. Most people go to church just to be inspired, but this you're going to have to use your brain for something besides a hat rack to get this. Amen. The seed doesn't actually produce the tree. If you plant an acorn, did you know in that seed is not an acorn? Some people will say anybody can count the number of seeds in an apple, but nobody can count the number of apples in a seed. And the point that they're making is you plant that seed, it can produce an apple tree, and then each one of those apples has seeds in it, and it goes on and on. And I agree with the point that they're trying to make, but did you know that a seed itself, that apple tree isn't in the apple seed. The apple seed, now think about this, the apple seed activates the ground and the tree actually comes from the ground not from the seed the seed somehow or another activates what's in the ground and starts drawing these nourishment this nutrients out of it if you don't believe that plant a seed in barren ground 
that doesn't have the right composition, doesn't have the right mixture, and it won't produce. The seed doesn't just produce by itself. The seed activates the ground. And I'm not going to go into depth on this, but if you were to turn over to Genesis chapter 1 and read it, when God created the heavens and the earth, there were four different words for create used in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. One of them means to create from nothing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything physical out of nothing. But then all of the other words for create mean to form, to mold. One means to build. But you build, form, and mold from things that already exist. So God created everything in the, in the beginning and then it says, let the earth bring forth the living creature. And out of the ground, the Lord formed all of these animals. Did you know that when he created dirt, in the dirt was all of the animals. Our bodies, human bodies came out of dirt. He formed us out of the dust of the ground. All of the nutrients, everything that was needed... Man, this is a great revelation. I don't know if you're getting this or not. But this is one of the reasons that I'm not into all of this environmental stuff. Now, I'm not saying that we should trash our planet. I like things to be pretty. This is a manicured campus. I think it's beautiful. We ought to take care of what God's given us. But people that don't know God, they think that the earth is fragile and that we're going to destroy it. It's impossible. It's impossible. You can't destroy it. God built this planet to be resilient. And He anticipated everything that we will ever need. Did you know that they have just found some new oil deposits in the United States that are eclipsing everything that they've ever seen? There is enough oil in the United States alone to power the entire planet for over a hundred years. There is no shortage of oil, fossil fuels. And some people say, well, but they're destroying the environment. You know, I remember when I was a kid, they used to talk about how the streams were polluted and stuff, and they said it'll take generations for them to recover. And they passed some laws. They quit dumping pollutants in the water. And did you know that they were surprised? But in just a year or two, the things had totally cleaned itself up. God's anticipated everything that the world could ever do or the human race could ever do, and He has built resiliency into it. He told us how the earth is going to be destroyed and it's not through pollution or through atomic bombs. And he has anticipated. I've got a guy that works for me that has built an engine that runs off of water and he's driven his car over 100,000 miles on water. If you run out of fossil fuels, use water. Somebody, well, they can't do that. Well, don't tell this guy who's driving his car on water, amen. It can be done. And I tell you, there is no shortage. It's just a lack of creativity. God has anticipated everything. And he put into this planet and into the atmosphere and into everything, the, everything that we've ever needed. God didn't just say, let there be the earth. He thought things through. He thought through everything that could ever happen, every need that the human race could ever have. If we get to where we have 14 billion people on this planet, God's anticipated that. And there is not a shortage of anything. We may have to start doing things differently than we do them now, but God's anticipated everything. People who are sitting here and looking at the earth as being fragile, in a sense, it's a criticism of God that God wasn't able to anticipate everything that's going to happen. God didn't do it as well as He should. I'm telling you, God's intellect is so far beyond our ability to understand. He created everything. So anyway, I could go on and on with that. But in the dirt, God created elephants, zebras, uh, giraffes, anything. And He, with His Word, His Word was the seed. And out of the ground, it said, God formed all of these animals. And they came out of the ground by His Word. And the scripture here in Mark chapter 4 is comparing the ground to our heart. The word of God, the seed, has to be sown in our heart. And when you take the word of God and put it in your heart, your born-again spirit is identical to Jesus. 
It's not a baby spirit that has to grow up and it only has a tiny potential and when we get to heaven, we'll reach our full potential. No, in your spirit, you are exactly right this moment as Jesus is. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. In this world, not in the world to come, but in this world. Your born-again spirit is as perfect and complete right this moment as it will ever be in eternity. You have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16. You have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. People say, I don't know everything. That's because you're operating out of this brain. You've got the mind of Christ down here in your spirit. You know all things in your spirit. Your spirit is perfect. It's complete. And when you take God's word and sow it in your heart, that seed activates this life that's in your spirit, the nature of God that is on the inside of you. It just begins to start automatically producing. You don't need God to come and put his hand upon you and release healing. You've got the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19 says that. The same power that raised Christ from the dead. You've got raising from the dead power on the inside of you. But it's just like dirt. If you don't plant a seed in dirt, you could lay on that dirt. You could pray over that dirt. You can do anything you want to that dirt. But if you don't plant a seed in it, the potential that's in that dirt will not manifest itself. And the potential that's on the inside of you will not release its life until you plant the seed of God's Word in your heart. But when you do that, and if you will put it in your heart and protect it, and just let it stay there night and day, it will automatically, the earth automatically of herself will just begin to start bringing life to that seed. You know, there's something about dirt. People, I've had people comment on me and say, you're as plain as dirt. Because I don't scream and yell and shout and have a a handkerchief up here wiping my fevered brow and say glory to God. And I don't have all of the religious things. And anyway, because of this, I've had people say you're as plain as dirt. Now I take that as a great compliment. <laughs> dirt is awesome. But did you know what? If you don't plant a seed in it, you could lay on that dirt, you could pray over it, and nothing is going to grow if you don't plant a seed. You have to put the seed of God's Word in your heart. And when you do it, and when you meditate on it day and night, uh, it says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, when you've meditated on it day and night, then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. People are praying for prosperity and success, but they aren't planning the word. That's like a person who's praying over the ground and wondering why nothing is growing. You have fasted. You've prayed. You've got a hundred people to pray. It doesn't matter how many people you have pray. You don't get what you pray for. You get what you say is what the Bible says. You get what you believe. You have to speak God's word into your heart and plant that seed. And then it will start growing. And it will just happen automatically. You heard Esther's testimony today about coming to Bible college and how she just didn't realize that she could make a difference. And yet the Word of God, sitting under the Word for four hours a day, five days a week, for two years, it just changes you. And you don't even know how. You don't even know why. I remember this one guy that came to our school. He was a young guy, about 20 years old. And uh, he was a, a black young man from the inner city of Chicago. And he was from an area where they had a person killed every day in his area. And his, his mother was a partner of mine, and she bought him a car, uh, bought him an apartment to live in, and said that she would pay for six months of his school if he would go to Karis Bible College. And so he came just to get the car and to get the apartment and stuff. And when he came there, he told everybody, he says, I'm out of here after Christmas. I'm gone. I'm not staying. And he was a nice kid. Everybody liked him, but he made no bones about it. He says, I am not coming back. I came just to get this stuff. 
But he sat under the word for four hours a day, five days a week for about six months. Hey, he went home at Christmas and he couldn't get along with any of his old friends. He had changed so much. His attitudes had changed. And he came back and finished two years of school. He now pastors a church. It totally turned his life around. And he didn't even want to change. He didn't intend to change. I don't recommend that approach, but I'm saying that that's how powerful the Word is. If you would sit and just let the Word of God soak into you, and if you would meditate in it day and night, then you would make your way prosperous, and then you would have good success. You know, if what I'm saying is true, which it is, then why isn't every person just completely absorbed with taking God's Word and meditating on it? Why is it that you would rather watch a football match? Why is it that you would rather do something, watch people kill each other and yell at each other and stri have strife and stuff and watch that rather than study the Word? It's because you don't know how powerful it is. You know, if I had something physical that I said, take this pill, and I guarantee it will heal you of any sickness, any disease, any pain that you have in your body, any deformity, anything. Take this pill and it would heal. I guarantee you people would mob me trying to get that pill. And yet I'm telling you the gospel. Amen. Amen. I'm saying if you would take the word of God and if you would meditate in it, it would be health to all of your flesh and life to them that find it. It would cause you to have perfect peace if you kept your mind stayed upon God. If you don't have peace, it's not because something's wrong with your chemicals in your body. It's not because you need to take some pill and balance your hormones out. It's because you aren't keeping your mind stayed upon God. You're looking at things the way the world is looking at. You're letting them tell you what to think and believe. Amen. If you can't say amen, say oh me. It's the truth. This is how simple it is. That's exactly how simple it is. It's not easy. The hardest thing you'll ever do is control your thinking and let, instead of letting somebody else tell you how to think. But I tell you what, it's worth the effort. And brothers and sisters, this is how powerful the word is. It goes on to say in that 28th verse, it says, first the blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. You know what that means? There's steps and stages. Some people hear me testify about what God is doing in my life, and they, they hear a testimony, and they say, all right, I'll try that, and they sow the seed of the, God's word. They start speaking, well, by his stripes I'm healed, and they don't understand that you grow into this. It's a progressive thing. When you plant a seed, you don't just instantly see the tree grow up the next day. This Douglas fir that we saw down there in Thornhill, it took a hundred and or nearly two, 190 years, nearly 200 years for that tree to get as huge as it is from one little seed. It takes time. There's first a blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. But there's people that just say, all right, I'm going to try this, and you try it for a day or for a week. And if you don't get a full result, then you say, well, the Word doesn't work. No, the Word works. You've got to work it. You've got to give it time. This isn't just a short thing. It's like a lot of people with their diet. There's a lot of people that will fast. They will put themselves through terrible things and eat this stuff that's not food. It's what food eats. And you'll deny yourself and do all of this to lose weight, but then as soon as you lose some weight, boom, you go back to eating all of the junk. You can't do it that way. You're going to have to make a decision that from now on and for the rest of my life I'm going to eat right. You can't do it in spurts. You can't seek God in just spurts. You can't wait until you've got a crisis on the horizon and then go try and sow your seed and pray that it comes up in the next two days. No, you're going to have to get to where you live by faith. The Bible says the just live by faith. They don't vacation there. They don't go there once a week. This is where they live. They live by faith. You have to live in the Word of God. You have to get to where the Word of God controls you more than anything else controls you. 
I had somebody come up to me last night and say, well, take care. I said, for nothing. The Bible says be careful for nothing. You know what? You won't even sit there and let people say, well, take care. No, I'm not going to take care. I cast all my care upon the Lord because he cares for me. People come up and say, well, it's flu season. Have you gotten the flu yet? No, because there is no such thing as a time when the word of God doesn't work and that I'm susceptible to sickness. And you can say what you want, but I don't get sick. It's been 51 years, and I've had about twice that I've fought sickness in 51 years, and that was because of my own stupidity, because of overworking myself. And I am human, and i got to pace myself. One time I taught 40 times in one week, and then the next week I taught 41 times, and I got so sick I couldn't hardly stand it. But that was because of stupidity. I don't get sick. I don't believe in getting sick. Some of you, oh, you can't live that way. Well, it won't work for you then. you got to believe it. But God's Word will produce health in your body. Man, that's awesome. It is so simple. God has given us all of these exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of His divine nature. These are God's seeds. You plant them in your heart and this nature that you received when you got born again, it just automatically Starts coming out. you got to give it time. It can't be just something you do for a week. It has to be a lifestyle. But you start living in the Word of God. Let the Word of God live on the inside of you. And it just changes you effortlessly. It's effortless change. You know, when you plant an apple seed, nobody's ever walked by an apple tree and heard it just moan and groan and shake and, uh, there's an apple. That's not how it works. You just plant that seed and it's the nature of that tree to just produce an apple. But you got to give it time. You know why it's so hard for some of us? We are praying and fasting and we've got a hundred people on Facebook praying with us and agreeing. We're doing all of these things. You know why it's such a struggle? Because you don't live in the Word of God. You just go there when you're in trouble and get some kind of a promise and pray it and wonder why the Word of God isn't working in your life. That's not how it works. The Word of God is incorruptible. It works every single time. But you've got to do what these passages are saying. There's first a blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. We have people come to our Bible school and they see me and the other instructors and all collectively our, our teaching staff has over a thousand years of ministry experience if you put us together. And they see what's happening in our life and people just immediately want to see the exact same results and they don't understand that it took time for us to change our thinking. It took time for us to grow. If God would have tried to get me to do what I'm doing now, even 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it would have killed me. I couldn't have done it. I hadn't, didn't have the growth to be able to do it. I had to grow and just stay with God step by step by step and God is blessing us. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God loves you. God wants you to prosper in every area of your life more than you want it. You do not have to beg God. You don't have to plead. You don't have to go and get other people and put pressure on Him and just badger Him until He lets go of His blessing. All you got to do is take these incorruptible seeds and plant them in your heart and meditate on it day and night and it will just change you. It's automatic. The only thing that can stop God's Word from producing life in you is you. Your lack of focus, your lack of staying with it, you digging the seed up and saying, well, I tried that and it didn't work. If you just live in it and walk in it and meditate on it, keep your mind stayed upon the Lord, the Word of God will automatically draw out of you this life that was placed in you through Christ. And you will prosper. God has never made a piece of junk. God has never made a failure. There are some of you, I'm saying this in love, but you need to confront some of these things. There are some of you that aren't making a difference in the world that you live in. 
There are some of you that if people at your work found out that you were a Christian, they would be shocked. Because you don't talk about the Lord. You get as sick as they do. You're as poor as they are. You're as worried as they are. You're as bothered as they are. You aren't making a difference. People would be shocked to find out you're a Christian. That's not the way God made you to be. And I can guarantee you if that's the way you are, you have not been meditating in the Word of God. The Word of God will make you different. You will stand out like a healed thumb. You'll begin to start seeing difference. People come say, how come you never get sick? How come you aren't bothered by the things that bother everybody else? Why aren't you worried about losing your job? Why aren't, and they'll start asking you. I guarantee you, the Word of God will transform you. But there are some of you, and I'm saying this in love, but you are just like everybody else that doesn't know God. That You aren't drawing on the life that's on the inside of you, and it's because you haven't planted the seed. That seed's not abiding in your heart. If you would let it abide there... Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you will ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. You need to meditate in the word and not be a Sunday only Christian. This is Sunday. I'm glad you're here. I'm not trying to discourage you from coming on Sunday. But I'm saying coming on Sunday morning for an hour is not going to compensate for you just spending the rest of the week thinking like everybody else thinks. You've got to get to where the Word of God dominates you. And I know somebody's thinking, well, I I have to work for a living. I'm not like you preachers. (laughs) I tell you what, we've got plenty of things to occupy us. I've got 650 employees. And did you know what? Uh, you're always going to have some kind of a problem. (laughs) We just had a major problem in the last couple of days, and as soon as I get home, I'm going to have to start dealing with that. i got things that can occupy me and take my attention away from the Word of God the same as any of the rest of you. It's wrong for you to think that you don't have time to be in the Word. Did you know the same part of you that worries is the same part of you that meditates? If you can go to work and worry about your marriage, about your finances, about your health all day long and yet still do your job, you can also go to work and meditate in the Word because worry is nothing but meditating on what could potentially go wrong, what might happen. The Word of God, you just meditate on it. You're meditating on what God has already said and you can keep your mind stayed on that constantly. You can do this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down of imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. You have weapons that can bring every single thought into compliance with what God's Word says. But our mind is kind of like a muscle. If you don't use it, it'll atrophy. And if you haven't been focused on the things of God, you may not be able to keep your mind stayed upon God without going and getting a fix from the television or going and getting a fix from your magazine or from your novels that you read or whatever. And at first it may be hard, but you start exercising your mind and start focusing on the things of God and within a short period of time, you can become addicted to the things of God. The scripture talks about the household of Stephanus who have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. You can become addicted to the word of God to where, man, you just can't stand it if you don't spend time in the word of God. You can do that. Every one of you can do it. And I tell you, what I've said here today is really simple, but it's really profound. And if what I've said is true, which it is, then why in the world aren't we taking these God seeds and planting them in our heart and letting it bring out the the miraculous supply that God has placed on the inside of us? Why would you live with sickness when by His stripes you're healed? What the seed says, the Word. Why would you live with poverty when it says that He became poor so that you through His poverty might be made rich? 
Why would you live with oppression and depression when he's delivered us from this present evil world? It's because we aren't planting the seed. We are being more influenced by the way that the world thinks than by what the Word of God says. I challenge you today to put God's Word first in your life and meditate in it. And you know, to get started, man, I've got, you can go to our website. I've got over 400 of my teachings that are free downloads. You can meditate on the Word and help me get you started, but ultimately you're going to have to get to where you feed yourself. But to help you get started, I've got teaching. Of course, this book that Chris wrote, John has teach. All of us, there's, you know, today, I was talking to one woman this morning who lives in a place where there isn't a good church. And I said, well, you ought to think about driving down here. You ought to think about going somewhere else. A church alive is worth the drive. Don't just go to... Just don't go to the first church you come to. But I said, there really is an excuse. Today, with the internet and with CDs and books and the things that we have, you can find material that will help you study and grow in the Word of God. There is not an excuse for one single person in here not to let the Word of God begin to be the dominant force in your life. And if you do that, it will just make that earth bring forth fruit of herself. It will supernaturally just start producing. And I guarantee you, your life will be totally transformed. Y'all believe that? Yes. Amen. Amen. Is there anybody here, last night we gave an invitation for people to be born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit, but is there anybody here that wasn't here last night or maybe you didn't respond last night? If you don't know Jesus personally, you first of all have to be born again. That's when you get your nature changed and that's when God places himself on the inside of you. Everything I've said today was written to Christians to people who've already made Jesus their Lord. And then you sow the Word of God and the Word of God begins to bring this life out. But if you've never made Jesus your personal Lord, you need to be born again. And then once you're born again, it's like fertilizer. You know, the soil may not be everything it's supposed to be, but you can fertilize that. And when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I tell you, it just releases a supernatural ability into your life to receive. I was reading a testimony this morning of somebody back in the United States who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they said they didn't realize what they got but when they left there all of a sudden they weren't negative anymore. All of their negativism was gone. They began to start being happy and joyful and they, it took them about a week or two to realize that it's because I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. Everybody in here needs to be born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit. Is there anybody in here who doesn't have one or both of those and you want me to pray with you this morning? Anybody? Here's some right here. Praise God. This is awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else? Like I said, we probably had 30 people or more last night come forward, but man, we don't want to deny anybody an opportunity. You must be born again and you have to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues in order to release that power. Anybody else besides these two ladies here? Anyone else? Praise God. Could I ask you ladies to come up here and let us just pray with you? Isn't this great? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Where are you from? Carlisle. Carlisle. I know where Carlisle is. I've been there. Are you from Carlisle also? <laughs> You're the mom. Yes. So... Have you all ever made Jesus your personal Lord and been born again? But you're ready to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues? They've been talking about this and tried, but today you're going to receive. Amen. Could I get a couple of our prayer team to come up here and stand here and help me pray with them? Just stand right here in front of me and let me pray with you. Father, we just agree. And we thank you, Jesus, that they've already been born again. According to the Word of God, they already have this power on the inside of them. Now, Holy Spirit, we are asking you to come and release this.
We just release this power and anointing of the Holy Spirit to flow through them right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. I release this power. And thank you, Father, that they receive right now. Those of you that had this baptism of the Holy Spirit and pray in tongues, let's just begin to worship the Lord right now and speak in tongues so they won't feel like we're just listening to them. And as we speak in tongues, God just gave you the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now you open up your mouth and you begin to speak with us right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Pronto cobrea sin de levia hombre cambrendo hombre. You got to open your mouth to speak in tongues. Talk. Keep a catarayanto, pro sin de levi carra para tane ambro, soro brandi ki erembre sopra pranta. Man, the power of God's all over you. Thank you, Jesus. You can't speak in English and tongues at the same time. Let's pray in tongues. That's it. Now talk. Just keep speaking. That's it. Just, man, the power of God's flowing through you. Are you speaking in tongues? Your mom is. You don't think God would give the Holy Spirit to her and not to you, do you? Man, you got the power of God. You know, God shows me that right now, I don't know you, but the Lord shows me that you're going to have to get a passport. You're going to be traveling the world. God is going to send you all over the world. There is an anointing of God on you. Ever since you were a little girl, you may not have even recognized this, but there is a calling of God on your life. And you're going to be traveling the world, impacting people all over this world. God's going to use you to touch people. You've wanted to do something. You've wanted to make your life different. You're wanting to make a difference with your life. And you just haven't known how to do it. Receiving this baptism of the Holy Spirit is going to totally transform you. You're going to leave here with a fire built on the inside of you. Here's the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit flowing into your life right now. As you pray in tongues, God is going to start speaking things to you, showing you things that He wants you to accomplish. Praise God. Your future is so bright, you got to squint to look at it. Man, it's awesome. God's going to use you in powerful, powerful ways. Thank you, Jesus. I want to give both of you a book that will explain what happened to you. Did you? Have you ever felt like that, that God had something special for you? Yes. I have. I feel like I've been running from it nonstop. Running from it. Pushing it away. It's I over think. today. I believe you just submitted to it. God's going to change your life. Thank Were you speaking in tongues? I think so. You were. I heard you. I, I want to give you this book to both of you. And you read this and it'll explain. And that speaking in tongues is really important, but you need to understand what happens to get the full benefit of it. Yeah. Yes. You're going to travel the world. Oh, praise God. Praise it's going to be awesome. Praise awesome, God. awesome. Did you come for the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Didn't I pray with you last night? Did you receive last night? Did you speak in tongues? Not yet. Well, you read this book. I agree with you. I believe you're going to receive. Hey, God bless you. Awesome. Praise the Lord. You know, we're going to get a quick bite of food, and then we're leaving, and I'm flying out today. Amen. We're going home after two weeks. So 
I hope that you'll give me the freedom to go ahead and, and leave and not stay around. But I'd like to invite our prayer ministers up here. These are people that are students that have been trained how to pray. And we saw some great miracles last night. We had a man that had a uh, cancer on his back. Is he here this morning, the man that I prayed with? I don't see him. But he was in a wheelchair. Uh, he could stand and walk, but he had so much pain, it was just hard for him to do it. And anyway, we prayed with him. The pain was totally gone. And by the time we were leaving, he said he felt perfect. Amen. And I believe that he was healed. We saw a lot of miracles happen. And these are the people that prayed for him last night. So if you need prayer for anything, they're here to pray with you. And uh, we would love to help you any way we can. But the long-term answer is exactly what I talked about today. It's the Word of God. Any need that you have, plant a seed of God's Word. Meditate on those seeds, and I guarantee you it'll change your life. Amen? John, I'm going to turn it back over to you and let you have the service. Thank you all for letting us come. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Andrew, we, we just thank you and Jamie. We thank Paul and Patsy for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to come and bless us, bless this nation, and bless our online viewers as well. Could we just give them one great big cheer before they go, folks? Amen. Praise the Lord. We do. We do have a, they do have a plane to catch. We... We need to get them back on the road very, very quickly. So please, please respect that. I know that you will. Uh, but just watch this space. I don't think this will be the last time that this will be happening. So thank you all also for coming from all over, not just Scotland, from all over, not just the UK. You've come from Europe. You've come from the, the, the Mideast and all of these places. You've even come from the United States. So we have just been so blessed as a nation to welcome you here to the promised land. Enjoy one another. And please remember, if you need ministry, these guys are every bit as filled with the Holy Ghost as Andrew is. But listen, as you are also, you can lay hands on yourself and you can speak life over yourself. There is Death and life is in the power of the tongue. So we just want to encourage you, even as this church, to start speaking life over you. There's two things in life, problems and a solution. Your problems always come from the devil. Your solution always comes from Jesus. Who is there first, Jesus or the devil? Jesus. That means that your solution was there long before your problem ever came near you. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. God bless you all.